Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Um, today we have Kaya Jenk. He's a very special guest. Hey Kaya. How's it going? Good, good. Um, yeah, we're really excited to have him. He knows a lot about the carnival diet and nutrition and um yeah, and ketogenic ways of eating as well. Do you want to sort Correct. of talk about what you do, Kaya, and how you feel on the carnival diet? And sure. So um I just finished my two degrees in psychological science and business. Also, uh, this year, I published my first uh, scientific research article pertaining to uh, low-carb ketogenic diets and how they affect athletic performance. I've been eating this way for about um, almost three years now. And i got to say, from, uh, from my own anecdotal experiences, I've noticed the benefits that I've uh, – that I've, no I've noticed benefits on this dietary pattern, which have been uh, phenomenal. Mm. So, Kaya, what are some of those benefits? What are your main best benefits that you've received from the three years of Carnival? One would be energy production. I feel like I have more energy, uh, mental clarity, and I guess in general, um, physiological and psychological function. Yeah, my, my brain function in particular has been the best it's ever been. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Why do you think, why do you think that, your brain function, your energy is getting better. What do you think's behind that on the carnival diet? Okay, so a lot of uh, protein, for example, uh, is being uh, well, sorry, is important for uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. Like for example, uh, serotonin, you need tryptophan, or um, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, you need tyrosine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And GABA, you need things like butyrate or beta hydroxybutyrate, which is um, a ketone body. So yes, um, these would be some of the things that help in uh, one's brain function, but also getting the adequate um, micronutrients in the diet too, in order to uh, function properly on a neurological level. Yeah, that would be why uh, I'm functioning the way I should be functioning in the first place. And we can go more into this uh, as we progress through this interview. Yeah, sick. Um, so what sort of made you sort of stray more towards a more carnival keto approach and like maybe cut out the vegetables? What, what was your thinking behind that? What made you? Yeah. Um, so 2018, I started going to the gym properly. I uh, quit football, soccer, and um, I adopted a ketogenic diet uh, halfway through the, through the year because a few people had suggested it to me and I'd um, done a little bit of research on it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try experiment with this. I noticed that I was um, losing body fat quite fast and uh, I felt quite good. I noticed my mental clarity was better. My skin in particular was also looking better and uh, I just felt better in general. Um, my well-being, my uh, vitality just was good. So um, I uh, did that for quite a while. I would also try diets that were mixed macronutrients. So, you know, I'd have plants, uh, fruits, vegetables, and meat. I never wanted to cut meat out of the diet originally because of vitamin B12. And I knew plants didn't contain these in the first place. So I always wondered, okay, meat has to be indicated. We must be uh, omnivorous in the first place. But uh, as time went along, I noticed all these people were um, having all these anecdotal reports of amazing effects from carnivore. So I decided at the start of 2020 that I was going to try it for myself. And uh, well, I noticed within the first month that I was feeling amazing, better than, even better than when I was uh, ketogenic, which fascinated me quite a lot. And here I am now, almost three years later. Mm. So what do you think it is about, so you were eating ketogenic, so you were doing a low carb diet, you probably in ketosis, um, so you're using fat for energy. Correct. So what do you think is the main difference between keto and carnivore? Like what's so bad about having a bit of extra plants and a bit of fiber? Yeah. Well, one thing would be, uh, because those, um, those plant materials have carbohydrates in them, very small amounts, the ones that you'd be eating on a ketogenic diet, you would instigate something known as the Randall cycle, the glucose fatty acid cycle, but also in, uh, inclusion of plants in a diet with meat, you would realize that 
a lot of the um, and there's there's literature on this as well. A lot of the meat that you eat and the nutrients that you're trying to absorb won't be absorbed because of anti-nutritional factors within the plants. And this can inhibit absorption of micro and macronutrients and um, inhibit energy production as well. We can also go into things like uh, deuterium, which can also affect mitochondrial function, uh, specifically ATPAs. Okay, cool. Yeah, so... So, so you think that if you were to just have, say, for example, a steak, and then if you were to have maybe a steak and spinach, you'd actually get less nutrients, micro and macro, than if you were to just have a steak by itself? Yes, correct. Especially because things like spinach, for example, not only are they very high in oxalic acid or oxalates, you've got other anti-nutritional factors in there as well, which can be quite toxic. And of course, there's quite a lot to name as well. Um, and also as well... Um, Pesticides that are also in these natural, naturally occurring pesticides too, which can uh, bind to minerals in the body and uh, inhibit electrolytes, electro electrolyte function, as well as uh, micronutrients from being absorbed properly and being utilized properly on a physiological scale. So yes, I would say that eating the steak by itself in comparison to eating the steak with spinach or kale or um, any other cruciferous vegetable or vegetable is indeed way better. Mm, why do you think that is? I've, I've heard some people talk about how sometimes when eating plant material, it would always be separated from eating meat in, in like our evolution. Do you think that's the reason why together they don't work so well? Yes, but mainly this is also because of um, the Randall cycle. Now, the Randall cycle is the glucose fatty acid cycle. And essentially what this is, is that glucose oxidation inhibits fatty acid oxidation. Now, these two um, substrates, energy substrates, glucose and fatty acids, compete with each other for energy production, for energy uptake. Now, what we notice in the uh, biochemical papers is that when we absorb both of them, the fatty acids tend to be uh, preferential that they are preferentially used as opposed to, um, you know, the glucose. Glucose will convert to about 10 to 40% into ATP, whereas uh, the fatty acids will actually convert 60 to 90% into ATP. But there is a reason for this, of course. Of course, gluconeogenesis plays a part in this, and it is demand-driven. The body wants to make its own glucose. And the other reason for this as well is because there's no carb-soluble uh, vitamins, but there are fat-soluble vitamins. I mean, vitamin A, retinol, D3, cold calciferol, E, alpha tosiferol, and also K2, uh, menaquinone, are fat-soluble vitamins. So is there an indication for fat as opposed to glucose? Yes, of course there is. And like I said, with gluconeogenesis, your body wants those gluconeogenic precursor amino acids and the uh, fatty acid precursors to make glucose and monocarboxylate transporters as well. Yeah, okay. So what you sort of said there is that, um, like we sort of summarized that, okay, we understand that protein is a staple in our diet and we need to figure out which macronutrient to aid to it. So whether it's fats or carbs, and you sort of just said that you think that fats is the best sort of pairing with protein absolutely 100 yeah. percent. yes yeah and um so a lot of people say oh but our brain you know needs glucose or we need carbohydrates so what's your what would you say to someone who said we need carbs like are carbs essential or no because of the fact that your body needs gluconeogenesis to occur in the first place and gluconeogenesis essentially is the um is the process where um uh, we make our own glucose in our body. It is demand driven. It's not supply driven. So we actually uh, need it. It is indicated. So um, including foreign carbohydrates can actually be quite problematic, especially when you look at the molecular structure of glucose, especially from exogenous sources. You'll see that on its molecular structure, it contains a polyhydroxy aldehyde unit. Now we know that ald aldehydes are quite mutagenic, they're genotoxic. They're carcinogenic, they damage DNA, RNA, and they're very highly reactive oxygen species or ROS. So um, yes, these are actually quite toxic. And not only that, uh, plant materials in general also contain deuterium. 
Now, deuterium interferes with something in the epithelial tissue of the gastrointestinal tract called uh, H0, H1 ATPase or F0, F1 ATPase, which is important for energy production in the mitochondria. So this can actually be quite detrimental to one's gastrointestinal health and in general one's uh, physiological health. Yeah, okay. Because mm. I've heard a lot of people also say that or oh, a lot of the reason why people are sick as well is because um, I think the water has deuterium in it, maybe. Um, yes, and other um, toxins as well, potential, uh, uh, potentially heavy metals as well. Yeah, um, fluoride, for example, is, is one uh, chemical that is in, well, that could be in water, which is quite toxic as well, neurotoxic, neurodegenerative, yes. Do, do you have, do you think it's, do you think it's would be a good use to get like a reverse osmosis or water filter? Exactly what I have, exactly what I have at home. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Reverse osmosis filter. Yes. Have you noticed? Have, have you noticed any difference? Um, It's just cleaner. Yeah. And I guess I, I noticed a little bit in the taste but again it's not very much you can't really tell the discrepancies between uh tap water as opposed to filtered water it's not that much of a difference but yes it is definitely cleaner but it's more long term mm -hmm. right like long term of health. course of course absolutely yeah. yes mm. yeah i'm um, coming back to that randall when we we're talking about the randall cycle randall um, cycle yes yes so someone that is on carnivore or an animal-based diet mm -hmm. and they, they might kind of say, oh, I just want to add a little bit of carbs, you know, here and there, or I want to add a little bit of carbs before my workout. So I just have a little energy boost. Sure. If, if the Randall cycle uh, happens in that situation, is that, could, you, could that be detrimental to their performance or to just to their health in general? Mm. Again, it really depends on the individual as well, because of the fact that one, they could be uh, adapted to eating some carbohydrate in the first place. And over time, of course, the body tries to adapt to its uh, internal environment. So if they were including some form of carbohydrate, especially in very low amounts, I don't think it's going to do too much to them. Um, but like I say, you have to worry about things like um, deuterium. And that can be very problematic for the, uh, like I said, the epithelial tissue of the gastrointestinal tract, which can lead to a uh, mitochondrial dysfunction so energy production becomes diminished however say if you're someone that goes to the gym for example and you're trying to get a bit of glycogen in your muscles and you want a bit of a pump you want to look more vascular then sure uh, the carbohydrates would help with that for example but uh, yes I, I don't see the reason for why it's needed or why it should be included in there in the first place especially when your body's making its own carbohydrate via gluconeogenesis Mm. so do you reckon it increases your ability to put on muscle eating a little bit of carbs or do you think yes. it's just for that pump yes especially if you are enhanced as well if you're someone who's enhanced and you want to you know build a super physiological amount of muscle then yes adding carbohydrates in would help with that because again to build that sort of muscle mass it's a pro-inflammatory uh, process of course and you're going to need um uh, insulinogenic responses to assimilate all those uh, nutrients into muscle cells, but also allow for uh, glycogen and glucose to be uh, uptaken within muscles as well. So yes, um, carbs would be necessary in that regard. And of course, for fullness as well, because you notice when you eat a ketogenic or carnivore diet, you'll notice that you're a bit flat. Um, you're not as mm. uh, bulbous. The, the muscle's not as bulbous or round as what it should be. Or what, what you think it could be or what it could be, yes. Yeah. So do you think, say, for a natural lifter, like, say, um, you said you were training for a few years. Do you think that yep. do, do you think that actually having carbs, maybe it doesn't actually give you more muscle, it just makes your muscles look more full? Or do you think that carbs actually could help build muscle? Um, if you're trying to build it to an extent that is uh, natural, then no it wouldn't really be needed in the first place. Because like I've said in the past in, a, in the podcast with James, yeah. carbs are osmolytic. They hold on to water. So when you're holding on to water, is that really muscle? Mm. Yeah. So have you ever thought of adding 
carbs for your for your training purposes and and just do you want to kind of elaborate about your kind of uh, lifting journey and how it's been on carnivore sure um so like i said 2020 was when i started carnivore and um i i noticed as well with my physique that uh i was looking very lean uh, i was um, not holding on to much body fat at all i was looking very defined and um it was about july august I decided, okay, I'm going to try a journey of uh, being enhanced. So I did. I tried uh, very, very low doses of testosterone and primobolin, which are two anabolic androgenic steroids. I tried them for about four months, and I was fully carnivorous during the whole experience because I wanted to see, can I mitigate side effects while using this? And would I not need to use um, anti-estrogens after in order, or CIRMs, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators after to uh, bounce back off a cycle. And I didn't, no, I didn't need to use them uh, because Carnivore was able to, you know, help me gain my, uh, my endocrine function and my, my general physiological health, which was fascinating. When I was enhanced, I, I did notice very, very rapid muscle growth. Mind you, when I was uh, enhanced, I was living my life like I was in a box, you know, it was very regimented. It was very controlled. And um, yeah, I noticed very, very significant results, even on those very small doses of testosterone and primobolin, which one would argue the testosterone dose that I was using was um, like a TRT dosage. It was 150 milligrams, so not much at all. But yes, the results that I was achieving, I was very proud of. I was very, uh, very lean probably like seven to 8% body fat. I obviously wasn't trying to go to that three to 5% body fat level because mm. um, that's not healthy. You're depleting your body of electrolytes. And of course your body needs fat on it in order to, you know, function. It needs fat for endocrine health. It needs it for general physiological function. So yes. So um, after the four, four months that I was enhanced, I decided, okay, I'm going to come off. Because, of course, during the whole experience, I was thinking about my health the whole time. I was thinking, okay, um, since I'm using, you know, anabolic androgenic steroids, what's this doing to my, um, my cholesterol structures in my body? Like, for example, my cell membranes, which, uh, you know, contain a phospholipid bilayer. And 50% uh, of that is cholesterol. But also uh, myelin sheaths in my brain, which are important for action potentials to occur or speed of propagation. Yeah, I was very concerned about these the uh, cholesterol in particular and also um, my general hormonal function, my endocrine function. So I stopped. I kept lifting. Uh, I still have to this day. And yes, it's been good for myself. Would I recommend people to go enhanced? No, of course not. I would always say to someone, if you're going to do that, learn about it first. Uh, understand what it does. And have your training, your sleep, your diet, all these regimens in order. Mm, okay. Because if you're going to make that leap, it's a big leap. And it can, it can also be very addicting, be, uh, addictive mm. because of the fact that, you know, you're bigger, uh, you feel more uh, masculine, more uh, ambition, drive, motivation. It does affect your neurotransmitters, so it can affect your uh, behavior. Yeah, it really can have those sort of impacts on someone. So, yeah, if one is going to do that, be careful and also do your research first before you make that leap, that jump. You reckon you'll think of going back on the um, performance-enhancing drugs in future or do you kind of think you're finished with them? I mean, to be honest with you, I have thought about it, of course, especially when you notice that, um, of course, the muscles look flatter than what they used to, um, what I used to look like. But of course, health comes first, of course. Health, well-being and uh, vitality always comes first. So no. Mm, okay. And do you also think, I'm not sure if you've had your blood test done recently, but do you think that... I have, yes. Yeah, yeah. Has your, do you think that your, would you say that your testosterone has increased on a carnivore diet? Um, if you ha if you got that checked, 
Yes, yes, it has actually. From memory, uh, it was about what six hundred nanograms per deciliter. Mind you, um, I've also been someone who's been enhanced in the past. So could that be affected from you know use in the past? Yeah, sure. However, still even rebounding from uh, using PEDs, yes, that's quite a good testosterone level. That's quite functional. Um, it's quite uh. It's quite liberating, actually, because I notice even in the gym now that I still have so much energy and that I can still work out very intensely. Mm. So do you think that is from the, even after coming off PEDs, do you find that you kind of still have that that boost from the PEDs or not really? You no, of, no, not anymore. Yeah, right. No, no they, they've obviously uh, left my system since then. Yeah. <laughs> But you and think when you were on them, I'm and when sorry. you were, sorry, yeah, when you were actually taking the PDs, when you went into the gym, what was the kind of difference? Uh, I just want to try and understand what it's like being on PDs. Sure, so. sure, yeah. I understand. No, go for it. Ask as many questions as you like. <laughs> um, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, training intensity is uh, way higher. Yes, you feel stronger, of course. Um, muscle growth especially if you're training properly, because again, anyone can use PEDs, whether it's um, steroids, SARMs, growth hormones, secretagogues, analogs, this, this sub, uh, growth hormone itself, uh, insulin, whatever else, and may not see any results from it. Not only because there's genetic factors, but also you got to realize some people don't actually put in the effort or they don't have the the regimented lifestyle like some have whereas for myself it was very regimented like i said it was like being in a closed box and i was just always focused on okay what's the next goal and what's the next goal and what's the next goal um yes you do definitely notice the effects it has on your behavior i wasn't aggressive on it i was generally quite calm but of course things like sex drive libido um motivation drive ambition confidence even yes these things do increase of course and of course you're always walking around all the time uh, more pumped than you've ever been which is i mean it's quite it's quite a nice feeling but again health comes first and um this is why i'm not on any peds anymore it's actually um funny because uh i started a week after that interview with james the last podcast that i was in well yeah. mm. Hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea. Um, like I said before, I don't recommend this to anyone. And uh, if you're someone who's trying to compete, however, and you're trying to uh, maybe you know get an IFBB Pro card or compete in the NPC, for example, sure, okay, you're going to have to use steroids to compete with all the other people because they're all using them too. Yeah, that's just mm. the sad reality of it. Mm, exactly. Um, talking about the about your blood tests do you mm -hmm. have any insight about what someone should be looking for in their in their blood results and what's kind of an optimal blood test results you know concerning um concerning testosterone uh cholesterol uh triglycerides and that kind of thing uh, so blood tests yes these are not a comprehensive uh test that actually looks for um health markers very well because of the fact that these can be very flawed um they have optimal ranges that people should be in, but do they actually indicate whether someone is actually healthy? Well, no. There's no uh, health kit out there that actually is able to measure whether whether um, we are healthy on a um, on a general level. Mm, but isn't something like cholesterol or you know other things on the that doesn't isn't that tell you what your health is or no? Because you you can um have a very high LDL cholesterol, for example, but is LDL cholesterol indicated in the body, especially if they're trying to say you should have it in a bit of a lower range uh, because, you know, there's some associative pieces of data that look at LDL cholesterol and its potential, uh, sorry, potential negative impacts. Well, no, because there are genes encoded in our DNA for the production of these things. And I believe we inherited cholesterol um, via na natural selection pressures about 4.5 to 4 million years ago during an evolutionary history. So yes, cholesterol is actually very much needed. LDL in particular, 
is uh, important for um, lipoprotein uh, transportation. It's a lipoprotein carrier. And it also mm-hmm. helps with mediation of insulin um, insulin resistance or um, too much insulin being spiked or um, having too much in regards to that insulinogenic response curve. Okay. So, so why do you think then that all these health professions and, you know, it's going around heaps for um, everyone telling us to lower our cholesterol. Do you think that they're just misinformed or do you think there's some maybe malicious intent behind it to, you know what I mean? Well, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, both. <laughs> I could say both to that, to be honest with you. I mean, you got people like Ansel Keys in the 50s, 60s telling people to not eat fat because fat is supposedly bad for you. But is it really? Well, when we look at where vitamins actually come from, for example, like the fat soluble ones, then no, not at all. Mm. And not only that, people who say that LDL cholesterol studies are causal and that they and that they establish that LDL cholesterol is bad. Unfortunately, these people don't know how to interpret statistical data. They don't know how to read a, a linear regression analysis or a um, correlation coefficient. So something could have an R squared or R value of 0.3, for example, which is a very mild positive correlation. But then they go and say, oh, we have evidence that LDL cholesterol is um, bad for us. But does it actually say that? No. Because when we also look at other studies on LDL cholesterol, we also see things like um, LDL cholesterol is associated with uh, more mortality, higher rates of mortality, or uh, Parkinson's disease, strokes. So the data is actually very mixed. And um, you can read papers by people, for example, like, um, is it Ufi Rabinskoff, who's talked about why these studies are methodologically flawed and why these studies don't actually give us an idea whether of whether um, LDL cholesterol is bad or cholesterol is bad in general. But mind you as well, we need cholesterol in our first place as a precursor to our hormones. And it's also a precursor to vitamin D3, coal, calciferol, go figure. So yes, we, we can't say that cholesterol is bad. Like I said, we've got genes encoded in our DNA for the production of these. We've got ApoB100, ApoB101, ApoE2, ApoE3, ApoE4, et cetera, et cetera. So to say that these are bad, is incorrect but also when cholesterol gets bad of course is when they oxidize when oxidized cholesterol happens so this happens via or they call them oxysterols and this happens usually via glycosylation of proteins now how does this happen well it happens via carbohydrate intake or too much glucose too much carbohydrate intake in the first place so we already have a problem there yeah so Mm. Do you think that it's necessarily not how much cholesterol it's bad? It's more the the size of the particle or the gly, whether it's glycated or oxidized or not. Oxidized, yes. Yeah, oxidized, when that sorry. when that uh, cholesterol particle becomes oxidized within the endothelial lining, yes, and that usually happens via chronic systemic inflammation. It's yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it happens via inflammation, pro-inflammation. Yes. Okay. Mm. And what's the problem with with it being oxidized? Well, essentially, when it's oxidized, um, it's not actually uh, functioning like it should be in the first place. It's not the actual molecule of cholesterol. It's now in another form, like I said, oxysterols. And this has the ability to turn into plaque, uh, atherosclerotic plaque within the endothelial tissue. So this is essentially how atherosclerosis starts. This is just one factor, but this is pretty much the main factor that occurs in regards to atherosclerosis. Mm, Because you hear that that plaque is caused from our saturated fat intake, but you don't get the the main the main part of the story that the plaque is caused from oxidization and yeah. See, that's not correct at all. Biochemically, that's not correct at all. When people try to eat fiber, for example, in their diet, the uh, vestigial appendix in our body, which used to be a cecum, a long time ago during evolution. It's designed to ferment that fiber into short chain fatty acids, which is what? A saturated fat. So to say that you um, don't need saturated fat in the first place is just ridiculous. But also, for example, um, mothers who uh, breastfeed their children, what does that breast 
milk contained in it that's that has quite a high amount of it as well over 50 mm. percent, i believe well it's saturated fat so yes to say that saturated fatty acids are bad is not correct no mm. it's um they're demonizing something that actually has you know an indication in our dietary pattern and has an indication in our uh, in our general physiological function so something i um something our brain is uh, made of or part of it is made of, why would it be bad? Mm. Yeah. So, so what do you think is you're talking a bit about how a lot of these diseases aren't actually probably from saturated fat and more from a no. chronic systemic inflammation. Yes. Do you think that, correct. So what do you think is like the recipe for heart disease or recipe for cardiovascular disease? What do you think is the main thing that causes Of course. It? This would be chronic systemic inflammation, pro-inflammation, and this happens, this is dictated by the Randall cycle, the glucose fatty acid cycle. So when you have both uh, both glucose and fatty acids competing with each other as substrates for energy, this is when problems occur. This is when uh, atherosclerosis um, and other chronic degenerative diseases occur. So the Randall cycle pretty much mediates this in the first place. When you have both macronutrients, carbs and fats fighting for each other, you're basically inhibiting the way uh, our physiology, our biochemistry should be working in the first place. Because like I said before, your body needs gluconeogenesis to occur. It is demand-driven. And when you're putting more glucose or other forms of saccharides, carbohydrates in your body, this is when problems start to occur. So do you think seed oils also plays a role in that systemic inflammation? Yes, I was just about to say seed oils as well because of the omega-6 <laughs> linoleic acids. Yes, they are quite toxic. They can affect uh, the skin as well, especially melanocytes, melanin, and of course, um, as well as affecting the uh, endothelial lining. So yes, seed oils are also very toxic. Uh, these are I think they're dehydrogenated or hydrogenated vegetable oils. Yes. Like canola in particular is very toxic. So when I cook, I'll use something like butter or ghee or worst case scenario, MCT oils or um, coconut oil. Mm. Why do you think, so the whole omega-6 thing, can you try and break that down a bit more about why omega-6 fatty acids are more inflammatory? Sure. It's also not the correct form of omega-6 that should be in the body. The, the correct form is actually arachidonic acid, and arachidonic acid comes from animals. Now, 25% of our brain is also made of, uh, or 25% of the fat portion of our brain, because the brain is 60% fat, 40% protein, 25% of that fatty portion is actually omega-6 arachidonic acid. So having a, an acid linoleic acid which is not the indicated form well that can lead to various problems it's pro-inflammatory it, it, it contributes to chronic systemic inflammation especially when mixed with carbohydrates and this is when problems can occur mm. yeah okay because that's actually quite interesting because i was watching a podcast the other day talking about you know pain and injuries and i was saying that neurofins actually neurofins role and painkillers role is literally to get the get the omega sixes out of the body, or get the finished product of the omega six out of the body, which is quite interesting because mm. we know that omega six is really pro, pro inflammatory, and the role of neurofin mm -hmm. is literally to clear it out of the body because you know it could be causing inflammation in the joints and giving a individual pain. So yeah, sure, sure, that sounds plausible. Yes, I can I can uh, agree with that as well. But yeah, no, neurofin in general uh, or Panadol, it's not something that I take in the first place. Mind you, when I eat a fully carnivorous diet, do I ever suffer from any head, any headaches uh, or any sort of um, sickness even like colds? Do I get viruses from people that have them around me? No, I don't. So that's another benefit that I've noticed too while following this dietary pattern. Yeah. Why do you think that is? What makes you what makes you on a carnivore diet more immune to just even things like a cold? Uh, proper uh, gut microbiome function, uh, less toxins in the diet, and also yeah, of course, um, proper enteric nervous system and uh, central nervous system function in the first place. The body uh, has exactly what it needs in order to allow for proper autoimmune responses. 
to mm. uh, combat these autoimmune conditions that could occur and other sort of uh, uh, and, and other sort of uh, immunological disturbances yes mm. well then talking about that as well a lot of people have kefir and yogurt and yogurt that uh, supposedly has a lot of probiotics um, in it mm. and that can be used for the gut microbiome and and just uh, for gut health in general do you have any thoughts mm. about kefir, uh, yogurts, and that probiotic um, dense foods? Well, it's interesting too because I'm a bit conflicted about this myself. Sure, it can have probiotic effects, the kefir or the yogurt, but it also does contain carbohydrate as well. Now, the good thing about these types of carbohydrates, like lactose, for example, is that it activates the cecum. So the cecum can actually uh, convert them into short-chain fatty acids and then convert into butyrate. But as I say in the first place, um, the ketone body beta-hydroxybutyrate is more powerful than butyrate itself. So is there really a need for the cecum or the vestigial appendix to uh, ferment those uh, the lactose into short-chain fatty acids in the first place? Maybe not. So yeah, that, that's uh, my stance on that. However, I do believe more research needs to be looked at in order to understand this phenomenon. Um, I have consumed kefir and yogurt in the past, and I do notice a bit of bloating when I have consumed it, and it probably is because of the carbohydrates that are in them. I believe. Have yeah. you guys tried that? Have you guys tried um, flim yolk before? Film yolk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I, I love the taste of it. Don't get me wrong, but um, I do notice a bit of a bloat after I do consume it. So, could it be contraindicated in our diet? Yeah, possibly. But again, I can't establish whether that's true or not. I can only speculate. Mm. So, Kaya, do you normally have dairy in your diet? I have tried uh, raw milk and raw cream. Uh, I love the taste of the raw cream. Luckily, it's very low in carbohydrates, which is great. Uh, raw milk, hmm. it's interesting because sometimes I feel good on it and sometimes I feel a bit pro-inflamed. I feel a bit bloated mm. after I consume it, especially when it's the raw form. So um, I'm not too sure in regards to whether it could have health benefits or whether it's detrimental. Um, one person that has a really good opinion on this is actually Bart, who I know you guys have interviewed before. And um, yeah, he, he likes to say that raw milk is not indicated in the diet, especially because um, dairy in particular can actually inhibit calcium absorption, potentially. Oh, wow. So yeah, there, there is that. Um, However, of course, when we're talking about taste, yeah, I really do like raw milk. I do, <laughs> I do like the taste of it, yes. <laughs> mm. So do you reckon that there can be, like that could um, cause a Randall cycle to start because of the yes. carbohydrates? See, that's also been a theory of mine is that when you consume the milk uh, or kefir or yogurt, for example, this may contribute to a Randall cycle activation, hence why you feel that bloated feeling, that um, kind of inflamed feeling after it. Yeah. So yes, that's also been a theory of mine as well. However, uh, this is not something that is uh, causally established, so I can't say whether that's true or whether it's not. It might not be, because there are some cultures like, um, is it the the warriors from uh, Kazakhstan and Mongolia who are quite tall and very um, well built. They also consume dairy in their diet and they're quite strong and very, uh, very mobile. So yes, uh, there, there could be an indication for it. But mm. actually another thing I'd like to add is also, is also uh, histamines as well. And, um, milk may contain histamines, which may actually promote a histaminergic reaction in people. Okay. Yeah. Histamine is quite interesting. Um, I think someone said, yeah, someone we're talking to the other day said that Michaela Peterson, I think, because she was eating too much beef, she got a histamine reaction to beef. I don't know if that's the reason. So now she only has no. to eat lamb. Now she can only eat lamb or something. I don't know. What do you think? 
that doesn't sound plausible because when you actually look at the foods that are high in histamines uh, in the animal-based kingdom, this would be aged cheeses, for example, and processed meats, not grass-fed beef. So that claim doesn't sound correct. And also a lot of plant materials are quite high in uh, histamines as well. So, yeah, we can't officially say that uh, it's the meat that caused the histaminergic reaction. Hmm. Is there a, sorry, you go. Oh, yes. I was going to say as well, uh, could she have potentially had prior autoimmune conditions or disorders to this um, way of eating, which may have been exacerbated by an environmental factor? I don't know, but uh, we can only speculate in this case. However, from my own research on histamines, it doesn't seem like, uh, doesn't seem like, uh, proper meats like grass-fed meats for example contain high levels of histamines and of course when we talk about deuterium as well they're also very well very low in deuterium compared to plants so i just thought i'd add that add that in there as well mm. um yeah i've also heard how eating such a diet where you keep eating the same food and same food again can be damaging and cause histamine reactions is there any validity to that statement i wouldn't think so i think it also matters what food you consume and whether they actually have you know histamines in them so to say that uh something has histamines like like meat for example you keep eating that dietary pattern and it has a histaminergic reaction i don't believe that's plausible or that it's an action that's an um, an accurate claim so yeah uh, i wouldn't say that that's correct no Okay. Mm. And what would you say with, say, protein absorption? Um, mm -hmm. I've heard some people, they say that, you know, they can't, their body can't absorb protein because maybe an autoimmune condition or, and even just other like standard, like gym advice, or you, they say you can only have, you can only get 30 grams of protein. You can only absorb 30 grams of protein per meal. If you need to eat like five to six a day. What's your sort of thoughts on that? No, that's not correct at all. Uh, especially because when you look at a, uh, things like um, insulinogenic responses. You need those precursor uh, gluconeogenic amino acids in order to instigate an insulinogenic response uh, with another macronutrient, that being fat, not carbohydrates. Because if you have carbohydrates with the protein, you will, um, you will produce an insulinogenic response, which is uh, too high. And this is why people have very high blood glucose, blood sugar levels. Uh, when you have an insulinogenic response, of course, you're shuttling nutrients into the cells of the body, but you're also allowing for electrolytes to be balanced, to actually be functioning properly. And you also mitigate glucagon, which is uh, the um, opposite of, or the opposite hormone of insulin to actually do its job and function. So, yes, um, saying that you only need a... Uh, a small amount of protein per meal wouldn't be correct as well because you do need an adequate amount based on one's uh, based on one's uh, needs, uh, based on their activity level and, of course, genetic individual differences to actually utilize that uh, insulin and uh, sh shuttle nutrients into cells like they should be doing. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of people in the carnival diet, they're always like, oh, super high fat, super high fat, super high fat, and sort of neglect the need for protein, protein. but don't, do you think that it will help yes. with balancing electrolytes and help with getting that insulin spike yes. throughout the day exactly yes yes because this again relates to the insulin glucagon ratio and um, this relates to of course like i said you're shuttling uh well insulin is shuttling those nutrients into cells so they can be utilized within the body but glucagon takes those nutrients out of cells because it's catabolic whereas insulin is anabolic so uh when you have, um, when you don't have an adequate amount of protein in the first place, your body isn't able to produce a proper insulinogenic response curve because you know you're not getting adequate an adequate diet in as well. So when you have an adequate amount of alanine, for example, or glutamine, which are the precursor gluconeogenic amino acids, then you can you can uh, allow for an insulinogenic response to a occur and therefore electrolytes can actually function properly so yes 
you need to have a protein intake that is adequate to, for, for oneself, especially based on your activity level, your musculature, and like I said, genetic individual differences as well. Do you have a general rule of thumb for how much protein people should be consuming or is it just it's so varied depending on the individual that there's no point really? Yes, varies uh, depending on the individual. Of course, the um, the consensus is to eat one gram per pound of body weight. Uh, that's, I guess, good for muscle building purposes. But is that actually needed in a dietary pattern? Probably not. Mm. In Australia, I think, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd know that the on the back of packaging or whatever, it, it tells you how much protein that like the daily value that you should be eating. And I think in Australia, it's like 55 grams of protein per day for the, for the average adult. That's what it says on the back of, of packets. Do you think that's... 55 grams? 55 grams. Dead set. <laughs> Jeez, that seems very low, to be honest with you. Yeah. How you how are you supposed to have proper electrolyte and cell function in the first place? Because like I said, you need insulin in order to... Uh, in order to... Uh, allow those cells to absorb those nutrients you're going to have more gluco uh, glucagon responses and therefore uh, become deficient in electrolytes and actually suffer from various problems down the line how are you even allowed to um or how are you even uh, allowing gluconeogenesis to occur in the first place well mm. it's going to be very uh, inhibitory to that process so yes you don't have adequate amounts of alanine and glutamine to allow for that process to occur in the first place. And also for muscle building processes, you obviously want to have some musculature in your body so you can be mobile, function, have some strength. Mm. You won't have amino acids like the BCAAs, for example, or even the essential amino acids, the BCAAs being leucine, isoleucine, and valine, but also things like collagen production as well. Mm. Yeah. So you mentioned before also that you you um you released a scientific paper with um your mate James um do you yes. want to do you want to quickly talk about what sort of found, what sort of findings you found and yeah like with the ketogenic diet and athletic performance sure uh, so in this paper, we look at 63 different studies uh, based on ketogenic diet and how it influences athletic performance. We notice in some of the literature that those that are on a ketogenic diet, um, they have a higher VO2 max in, in, um, in sports, but in exercise. But um, again, these results can vary. Uh, mind you, these studies do have methodological flaws and therefore we can't um, causally establish anything in regards to this paper. Uh, we do notice in most of the studies that uh, we see that those that are in uh, ketogenesis or ketosis tend to actually uh, oxidize fat better and also uh, have better weight loss than those that do follow a high carbohydrate diet. But again, uh, results can vary um, the results can be mixed sometimes. And like I said, we can't establish anything causally from the paper that we've published. And of course, more needs, uh, more research needs to be done in the nutritional science space as well, because again, these are all epidemiological or um, naturalistic observations. They're not longitudinal. They, um, yeah, they, they don't establish anything causally. They're all associative. Mm. Yeah, so in terms of long-term endurance athletes, I know it's always drilled into us. I did PDHP at school, you know, physical yep. health and education. They say, oh, you need carbs, um, carb loading long uh, for endurance running, you know, have heaps of pasta the night before or something. What's the sort of thoughts on that? Um, do you need to carb load to do well? Or? Why would you? especially if you're not getting adequate nutrition in the first place, not only anti-nutritional factors, but also you're going to be having other problems as well. Like uh, if you're mixing it with some fatty acids, you're going to activate the Randall cycle. And also you're going to have deuterium in the diet as well, which will inhibit your energy function in the first place because it's um, leading to mitochondrial dysfunction. So would that actually help in sporting matters? No, no, it wouldn't. It would actually be uh yeah, it would be a paradox, actually. So why do you think so many athletes are still following the same advice then of just smashing down carbs and 
carb loading and do you think that slowly more athletes will become more keto in a step becoming a um become more keto adapted i mean it depends on the person to be honest with you some may have been eating carbohydrates for such a long time that their body has adapted to that sort of stimulus in the first place so they think or they must uh, feel like that is right for them uh however that will lead to long-term damage in the future so if they keep following that sort of dietary pattern they will suffer, unfortunately, because like I said, you need fat in your diet. It gives you those fat soluble vitamins, A, D3, E, K2, which you don't get from carbohydrates. Also, uh, actually, um, just to add on, sorry, you were talking about carbohydrates and whether they would actually help uh, in regards to energy. So people also seem to misrepresent scientific research as well. Like I said, people can read a paper and think that it causally establishes something without actually understanding, you know, a linear regression analysis or a um, correlation coefficient, which means that, for example, uh, say you have an R squared value of 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. This will only be a mild positive correlation. Does it establish that something correlates with something or causes something? No, no, it doesn't. This is very limited in terms of its inference. But again, a lot of people don't know how to interpret science. They don't know how to apply the discipline. So, yeah, there can be uh, problems in that regard as well. Yeah, so Kao, have you ever thought about studying nutrition or, you know, doing anything like that at university? I've thought about it, but once I understood what the curriculum involved, no. No, I would not study nutritional science or dietetics because I understand what I'd be in for and uh, the information that I or information that I would be taught. <laughs> what what sort of what sort of information um sort of things would they teach you, do you reckon? Uh food pyramids, uh, for example. Um maybe that a mixed macronutrient diet is better or that it should be more plant-based include things like grains in your diet, which would be the last thing I would ever consume apart from processed foods, of course, because uh, yeah, grains are very, very toxic. I mean, you look at things like not just oxalates, but phytic acid, for example, and uh, we don't have the enzyme phytase to digest that. I mean, I could go on with a lot of, uh, a lot of anti-nutrients that are in uh, grains, which, you know, are lectins, gluten. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, no, nutritional science would not be something I'd study. And also the calories in, calories out notion. That I've uh, understood to not be true either, especially understanding the science in regards to that and learning uh, the laws of thermodynamics. I don't know them all off by heart, but I do know for a fact that mass is not conserved. No. So, yeah, can you expand a bit more on that calories in versus calories out? It's something that, genuinely every single person especially in fitness. fitness and weight loss space they're always like okay just make sure that you're in a deficit and you, and you'll be losing weight so can you still be in a deficit and not lose weight yes of course like i said the randall cycle is what mediates us mediates inflammation so if you're not activating the randall cycle in the first place say you're eating five thousand calories of um fat and protein without carbohydrate, then yes, how would you be able to get fat via uh, that, that way of eating? Uh, in regards to calories in, calories out. So calories are a form of heat energy, correct? And um, what they do in order to measure calories within a food is that they use a machine called a bomb calorimeter. Now that machine is an isolated or closed thermodynamic system. So um, you could put a lump of coal in uh, a bomb calorimeter and it would come back with hundreds of thousands of calories. If you were to eat that coal, would you be able to digest that coal and actually utilize it? No, of course not. So that's already showing that, that there's a flaw to that argument. But also, like I said, um, the bomb calorimeter is a closed or isolated thermodynamic system. And uh, a humans aren't a closed thermodynamic system. We're actually open because we don't just use heat energy. We use chemical energy, potentially electrical energy. In regards to our brain, we use a 
or we could use electrical circuits and various other forms of energy. So no, it wouldn't apply to us. Mm. So is it mainly because the calories, the calories out can't be calculated well, or is it because the calories in can't be calculated well either? Oh, they can't be calculated well in the first place. Yes. Uh, and also you got things like the thermic effect of food where a certain percentage of the calories are burnt. Mm. It, it can't work as well because we've got to realize that energy produ uh, production happens on a biochemical level. We're trying to convert these foods into ATP. Now, if you have things like anti-nutritional factors and um, compounds like deuterium, does this affect ATP production? Yeah, well, of course it would. Imagine you're someone following a plant-based diet and you're trying to get creatine, which is a precursor to um, ATP. And creatine is an amalgamation of the amino acids arginine, glycine, and methionine. Now, we know plants don't contain methionine in them, which also you know, works with B12 via my, uh, methionine synthase, helps with the methylation cycle. Would they be able to produce ATP on their diet? No, because they don't have the precursors necessary to make that ATP in the first place. So that already shows that calories in, calories out is a, is a flaw in itself. Because again, it's a biochemical process. Yeah, so... That, ha that happens within our physiology. So to say that... Yeah, to say that um, we utilize calories as a form of energy just doesn't actually make sense because it goes against what we actually understand on a physiological biochemical scale. Okay. Yeah, cool. And so also on the topic of that, like absorbing nutrients, um, I remember when I was maybe a year or two ago when I started going to the gym, you know, I'd always look at the back of the packets of food to see how much protein and say stuff, sure. maybe vegetables like spinach or something or bread, I'd say it has yep. maybe 10 grams of protein. Do you actually think that although the label says 10 grams because it's got anti-nutrients, fiber and other stuff in it, we can only absorb maybe like three or four grams. Do you think that would be the case if it's on plant material? Yes. And that would be due to a variety of factors, mostly because of anti-nutritional factors. Like for example, if you're eating a, a protein, which is a uh, plant-based, are you getting things like a uh, heme iron in the first place? Well, no, because it's non-heme iron, the, the plant-based proteins or plant-based foods in general, or other things like the, anti again, I always talk about the anti-nutritional factors, but we know that these bind to minerals within our body and that they can affect ATP production in the first place. So how much of those um, proteins or even fats or carbs from those foods are actually being um, utilized by our cells for energy production for ATP? Probably not very much because again, of those certain factors like anti-nutritional yeah. substances, chemicals. Okay. okay, cool. And do you think, because obviously um, in the in the fitness space, they talk a lot about supplementing creatine for mental and um, physical enhancement sort of. Do you think that yep. on, a, on a carnival diet, there is a need to supplement creatine? Because I know we're probably getting maybe three, three grams a day if we're having a kilo or two of meat, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, personally, I don't use creatine monohydrate anymore. I haven't used it because I was, my, my philosophy is that because we eat enough uh, arginine, glycine, and methionine, which are, you know, the amino acids, which are precursors to creatine, why would I need to add more creatine into my diet? However, if you're someone who doesn't eat a carnivorous diet and you're weight training and you're trying to put on, you know, a decent amount of muscle, Sure, creatine would be very beneficial to that process. It would help a lot, especially with intracellular um, retention, water retention. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in terms of supplementation on the carnival diet as well, yep. do you take any supplements or do you recommend anyone take any supplements? I don't personally take any supplements, no. Uh, the only thing that I would add on extra to my, um, to my meals is salt, Himalayan pink salt to my steaks. <laughs> mm. So people were talking about, like for example, Paul Saladino having having muscle cramps or people experiencing cramps on the carnivore diet, uh, you know, from apparently a lack of magnesium and, and potassium like that. Electrolytes, yes, yes. Uh, this would act, like I talked about before, this would be related to the insulin 
glucagon ratio. Now, this is talked about by Professor Ben Bickman. He goes into this in quite um, quite a lot of detail. Now, like I said, glucagon is a uh, catabolic hormone and insulin is an anabolic hormone. So like I said, the insulin shuttles nutrients into cells, whereas the glucagon doesn't. It does the exact opposite of that. As I said, it's catabolic. So when you have an adequate amount of protein, which I don't believe Paul Saladino was in the first place relative to his activity level, his uh, genetic differences, genetic individual differences, um, and even his musculature, he wouldn't be able to uh, have proper electrolyte function because he's not getting adequate glucose from gluconeogenesis to allow for that insulin response to occur so that that mm -hmm. insulin could help within cells to help uh, with, the, with the electrolyte production. So yes, uh, I believe Paul Saladino wasn't consuming uh, the adequate amounts of protein relative to his uh, fat consumption that he should have been. Because mm, okay. Paul Saladino is quite an active guy. I mean, he's, he looks pretty good. Yeah, he's got a decent musculature. He looks like a fit guy. And, um, well, if he's having cramps or electrolyte-based issues, then that would most likely be because of his protein intake relative to how much mm. fat he consumes. Because so like I said, that insulin-glucagon ratio comes into play. So do you think because he's he's added some carbs in there and he's having all three macronutrients and obviously, like you talked about before, activating that Randall cycle, do you think he yep. could be in for some trouble in the future? Yes, absolutely. Um, especially because if he's including, um, no, not just fructose, fructose doesn't just have a, well, it doesn't have an insulinogenic response. But the path or what it converts into biochemically and what pathways it can activate in the body, this can be very problematic because honey, even though I love the taste of honey, I know that honey contains fructose and glucose in it and him consuming protein with that glucose is going to spike his insulin quite a lot to a level which is contraindicated. It shouldn't be that way at all because he is going to lead himself to uh, – higher blood sugar levels and uh, potential diabetes in the future, which would be, which would mean, um, of course, pro-inflammation occurring via that Randall cycle, which is what uh, diabetes or blood sugar is mediated by, the Randall cycle, or mainly mediated by. But also, yes, he would encounter various uh, immunological issues, endocrine issues, uh, yeah, neurological issues. Yeah, it will, it will end in a, um, a catastrophe for Paul Saladino if he keeps following this dietary pattern. But as I was saying with fructose, now fructose converts into uh, glyceraldehyde. Now we know aldehydes are quite toxic substances. They're not supposed to be consumed in our dietary pattern at all. And um, it can actually lead to chromosomal damage to human cells. And then there's also fru-1,6-bisphosphate. Now we know in the... Um, the cancer-based literature, the oncogenesis-based literature, that um, FRU16 uh, bisphosphate couples glycolytic flux um, to activate a pathway called RAS. Now, when this gene is activated, especially via fructose, this can lead to oncogenesis or cancer. And this is what the uh, Warburg effect talks about. Because again, they say that right. cancer cells feed off sugar. So... Mm -hmm. Would this be contraindicated in a dietary pattern? Well, yes, it seems yeah. to be that way, unfortunately. Because, I mean, believe me, if I could eat fruit or um, honey, I love the taste of them. Sugar's nice. It tastes great. But is it healthy? No. If we're looking at, it, at this from a, um, a health-based perspective, it's not the way to go. Yeah. Um, and I was also looking into a little bit also about, you know, the dangers of fructose and maybe because people were saying, oh, can I have a bit of fruit? And I think um, I was watching one of Chafee's podcasts and he was saying that fructose is actually broken down the same way in the, or broken down into the same thing in the body as alcohol is like, it's like ethanol or something. That's what he was saying. And um, he was saying that um, people who get fatty liver disease um, from alcohol, mm -hmm. um, they stop eating alcohol and then they still had fatty liver disease um, because the fr fructose and alcohol is broken down um, into the same compound 
So now they in introduce this new thing called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but it's actually caused by the same sort of compound, which was really interesting. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, because I couldn't it really... It seems plausible, yes. Because like yeah. I said, um, it breaks down into uh, glyceraldehyde and those aldehydes can be broken by things by, like um, al uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, I believe. And these things can also um, affect NAD production, uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is quite important for energy production in the body. So could this lead to uh, potential liver problems like fatty liver disease? Yes, that, that sounds plausible. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, another thing just on that fruit and meat diet, that animal-based type of diet, a lot of other people... Yep kind of advocating for it. Carnivore Aurelius is really famous on Twitter and Instagram. Yep, 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 yep. Um, so they kind of, they make an argument that having fruit is kind of like how our ancestor did. So, you know, they'd, they'd go around and kind of forage around and if there was fruit on a tree, they'd eat it and they'd kind of binge on it and then they'd have, they'd have meat as well. Uh, do you have something, do you have a kind of argument against that way of looking at it? Well, yes, people tend to have an addiction to sugar. So, of course, when they're eating something like fruit, which has a you know a sweet taste to it, of course they want to eat more of it because it is quite nice. It tastes good. However, mm. does this mean that it leads to good health outcomes in a human being? And, of course, we've got to look at other variables within this, like um, external environmental factors as well. And especially back in those times, was there a lot of uh, you know EMF radiation or poor uh, water for example like tap water or various yeah. other things no so of course their lifestyles would have been better in that regard uh, however does that mean it's actually indicated for um, those those humans of that time especially no no it wouldn't be because one we don't have that cecum you know to digest well we, we don't have a cecum because it's de developed into a, a small vestigial appendix to uh digest those um the cellulose the cellulose um like fiber for example yeah. and uh, convert them into short chain fatty acids or butyrate yeah. like um like yeah well we should be getting beta hydroxybutyrate in the first place which is a ketone body so yes fructose would interfere with that process and therefore it is contraindicated but also like i said you're also going to have various problems too with uh, some of the pathways that fructose activates, like the RAS pathway and oncogenesis occurring. So yes, there is that. And the glyceraldehyde too. Okay. Mm. And you, so on the topic of living as naturally as possible, you know, you mentioned EMF and stuff and you mentioned you also had a, you know, a water f uh, filter at your house. Um, yep. Yep. Do you think there's, do you think there's a lot of importance in, modern society like say for us if you want to improve our health to you know stuff like remove emf sources from our room or don't use deodorant because the endocrine disruptors and stuff like that do you what do you see that yes there is some uh, plausibility to those uh to those claims um like for example um uh, when, I, when I'm uh, sleeping, I don't keep my phone next to me or I put it on airplane mode so I don't have any 4G or 5G um, EMF radiation happening. Um, there's also uh, other environmental variables which I have you know, stayed, uh, stayed um, away from. Uh, trying to drink tap water is another one because of the fact that you could have fluoride or other heavy metals and toxins in there. Okay. Mm. Do you, do you place a big emphasis in your life about trying to live uh, like our ancestors or do you think that a lot of, you know, our efforts trying to live like our ancestors is kind of pointless and, you know, it doesn't really um, make too much of a difference in our quality of life or just our health in general? I think some of the things that our ancestors did, um, like, for example, uh, absorbing sunlight rather than putting sunscreen on, which, yeah. you know, sunscreen can have very estrogenic and carcinogenic chemicals in them. Yes, I would prefer to, you know, actually absorb vitamin D3 in the UV rays. Um, another thing would be grounding. Grounding should be more uh, common because when we look at studies of people who ground, we notice that the blood viscosity levels of these people change by is it 26 times the amount. So what we're noticing is that electrons are being donated. So they're actually getting antioxidant activity 
from this in the first place. Would so things like grounding. Yes, correct. Yes. Like the ions or something and the Earth's magnetic field or something. Yes, that's right. So wow. yeah, grounding, grounding would be indicated for sure. Um, yeah. And, and also sunlight absorption, yes, it, rather than trying to use uh, sun protective behaviors to uh, not allow for that to happen. What, what are your thoughts on that, actually, in regards to um, our, uh, our ancestors, what they used to do and uh, things now? Yeah, hun well, yeah, there's um, obviously life is completely different. And I think trying to reduce your time on screens, being yes. out in the sun more, you know, uh, yeah, just absorbing the sun. I, in my job right now, I work kind of a nine to five in an office type job, and it is hard to get oh. sun, you know sunlight, especially when if if it's in winter and the days are short, I get like no sunlight in the day, which yeah. I can't even imagine how detrimental that is. Um, so yeah, I, I always feel better after being in the sun as well. Your skin looks better, you Me feel too. better, yep. you feel yep. you feel genuinely just happier. Um, and I yes. always when I'm out in nature and kind of living more so like our ancestors would have done, I, I do feel, I just feel better, honestly. So um, probably because of, probably because they're part of those uh, natural selection pressures that have made us uh, that what we are and why we've adapted to those things, whether it be negative or positive natural selection pressures. So yes, I, I also believe that a more ancestral way of living is better. Um mm. Have we potentially adapted to some of the uh, newest inventions and discoveries within our uh, within our world? Maybe, but it doesn't compare to say you know uh, what we used to do four million years ago, as opposed to say ten thousand to five hundred or a hundred yeah. years ago. Uh, yeah. Like like the agricultural um, the agricultural revolution, for example, started about eight thousand to twelve thousand years ago. Yep. And we know that, um, yes, we know that uh, a, lot, a lot more grains were included in the diet in this case. But are these things detrimental to one's health? Yes, because of the anti-nutritional factors that do exist within these, uh, these grains. And one I'd like to talk about in particular is gluten. So gluten, mm -hmm. for example, binds to a protein called zonulin in the gastrointestinal uh, tract. And this can damage epithelial tissue with, within the gastrointestinal tract and lead to conditions like leaky gut syndrome, otherwise known as gut intestinal permeability. So there, there's that. There's also lectins as well, which um, also, you know, can be quite damaging to the uh, the uh, end. Of, I'm sorry, the epithelial tissue, and um, mm. you know, lead to also uh, gut intestinal permeability, leaky gut syndrome. So yeah, they're quite toxic substances that are consumed in our uh, in, in people's diets. Um, also, things like corn, for example, um, and it's got compounds in it like shaconine, for example, which can also be very toxic to one's gastrointestinal tract as well. Yeah, because you you always you always hear people who have allergic or have allergies, like people gluten free, people have yep. anaphylactic reaction to nuts um people can't have certain things it's but it's always it's always the plants and it's never the meat um exactly also, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do you think um do you think that um if you have kids you'd feed them the carnival diet from birth yes yes i would because obviously um i would want my kids to be as healthy and happy and um you know well looked after as possible so i would obviously do my best in order to allow them to have the best possible life that they could. So yes, of course I would. Um, if they want to eat plant material or um, they want to go the processed uh, food route in the future, hey, that's their choice. At least I tried, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't think many kids even want to eat broccoli though. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like maybe they want to oh, eat no. chocolate, but not broccoli and stuff. So <laughs> no, because I mean, look at some of the chemicals as well in broccoli, for example, even other cruciferous or green vegetables, um, isothiocyanates, oxalates, of course, being a main one. Um, actually, on, uh, oxalates, for example, have been uh, 
implicated in ADHD, which I've is heard interesting. Of that. It breaks like yes. the, the blood brain barrier or something. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, wow. it's in, it's interesting because they do also say that um, when one consumes, uh, well, originally the mechanism supposedly of ADHD occurring is that glutamate is unable to convert into GABA, a GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, and therefore cognitive function, inhibitory, anti-anxiolytic functions can be disturbed, and that can affect one's uh, yeah, affect one's functions. So they can be more excitatory and therefore be more uh, yeah, more um, active. More hyperactive. Yeah. Um, but they do say as well with carbohydrates, when carbohydrates are consumed, that glutamate can also convert into aspartate, which is known to be neurotoxic. So there's also that as well. Interesting. It's the same as well with high, high levels of vitamin C. When you have high levels of vitamin C in the body, it oxidizes into its oxidized form, the hydroascorbic acid, and that form actually converts into oxalate oxalic acid which we know is quite detrimental to one's health we know about calcium oxalate kidney stones or yeah. hypooxaluria um, so people who have gout for example have usually very high uric acid levels and a lot of people who do exhibit these problems the uh, gout for example tend to be uh, exhibiting hypooxaluria so yes uh, oxalates are a very toxic compound. They also bind to minerals within the body and they can inhibit ATP function as well. They do cross the blood-brain barrier. They are quite a scary substance, to be honest with you. When you look at the images of a, um, a calcium oxalate kidney stone and you see the crystals um, on the kidney, for example, via you know, looking at it from a magnifying glass, a really close-up image, it's frightening. So yeah, I try to avoid... Uh, especially cruciferous vegetables out of my diet, like uh, broccoli, for example. Yeah, because of how, uh, yeah, how toxic they can be. Because yeah, a lot of people I've heard, like even nutritionists I know, they say that, you know, meat's going to give you a kidney stone and, and stuff like that. But literally kidney stones are like mostly made of calcium oxalate or what you were saying. So it's got oxalates mm -hmm. in the word and meat has got no oxalate. Well, that accounts for what eight to nine out of ten kidney stones, calcium oxalate kidney stones. So yeah, oh. uh, it seems to be a pretty you know common denominator in kidney stones, the uh, oxalates. But again, you've got so many other anti nutrients as well in the diet, um, formatin like proteins, gliadins, even cyanide can be found in things like apricot seeds, for example, or apple seeds, apple kernels. Which yeah. again, cyanide we know is a toxic substance, very toxic. Uh, calcitriol, uh, trypsin inhibitors, which can lead to pancreatitis. Uh, alpha amylase inhibitors can lead to gut dysbiosis. Um, exorphins, phytoestrogens, xenoestrogens. I mean, the list goes on. Even salicylates. Uh, salicylates is an ingredient that they actually use in aspirin. And uh, we know that these uh, substances like salicylates can actually lead to various detriment, especially on a neuro, uh, neuro, yeah, on a neurological level. They can be neurodegenerative, and they can also lead to you know uh, bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract as well. So, yeah, there is quite a lot of substances within uh, plant materials that they produce. And again, the reason why a plant produces these, uh, this chemical warfare is because it's ambulatory. It's not ambulatory, right? They can't run away from their predators. So what they do is they produce chemical warfare because they don't want to be sliced or eaten or chewed. Yeah. And unfortunately, when we eat these things, they're not actually good for us. Mm. <clears throat> so, Kay, I just a bit of a more abstract question. If you were to redesign the food pyramid, what what would you kind of have if there was like three levels, level the the one where you're meant to eat a lot, then a middle, and then like a little bit? Mm. What would your kind of food pyramid look like, do you reckon? <laughs> well, of course, meat would come first. It would be the uh, the optimal of the food pyramid. Like red meat? Top. Of course, yeah, red meat, because you want nutrients, right? You want to get a diverse range, an eclectic range of nutrients. So yes, red meat would be up there. Um, 
I would say liver. However, there are arguments against liver as well in high mm. amounts because of copper toxicity and potential yeah. vitamin A toxicity as well, retinol. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, there is that as well. Um, yeah. Uh, in the middle, maybe I would have to put plants there, some plants, maybe the more uh, – so the ones that are less in carbohydrate, like avocados, for example, their fruits actually. Yeah, yeah. Yes, avocados, some fruits and vegetables like uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and some forms of dairy as well. Mm. And then last would obviously have to be the grains and probably fructose too because of some fruits because, yeah, fructose we know is actually quite a toxic substance, a toxic chemical. And... um. Just looking at the biochemistry of fructose, it's yeah, it's not something that should be consumed in the first place. It's quite detrimental to one's health. So, yeah, fructose is something I would try to avoid as much as possible. Yeah. Mm. So when looking at fruit or sugar and fruit compared to sugar in processed foods, let's say there's 10 grams of sugar in some watermelon and then 10 grams of sugar in some Oreos. Um, just looking at the sugar itself, eating the mm -hmm. 10 grams of Oreos and 10 grams of watermelon, do you think there's any difference whatsoever in how it affects the body or, or do you think one's better than the other? I would have to say one's be better than the other because even though, of course, the um, the carbs in them would try to convert into glucose so they can be utilized as energy, they'll try to. Um, of course, there's going to be other problems with that. For example, what other chemicals do they put in the Oreos? Because it is a processed food. It's made yeah, in China. Yeah, yeah, true. So there, there would be those those uh, problems with the Oreo as well, whereas the watermelon probably doesn't contain as many um, processed chemicals within it. Having mm. said that, though, a watermelon would have a lot of uh, toxic anti-nutrients in it as well, which would also impact its absorption and impact... Uh, yeah, the uh, health profile of that watermelon. So there are a lot of uh, variables to consider when trying to compare the two foods here in this case. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And in sugar by itself, just the raw form of sugar, mm -hmm. does that contain anti-nutrients and, and other harmful toxins? What do you mean? Like um, white sugar, like, for example? Yeah, yeah. I would assume so, because usually this is processed within a factory. So, yes. Uh, if you were to consume sugar on its own without pro uh, with protein or without protein, actually, let's say hey, you have the sugar by itself, uh, you wouldn't actually instigate the Randall cycle, but you wouldn't be getting any nutrition in the first place. So would it be good to eat in the first place? No, because you're not getting any nutrition. If you mix it with macronutrients like fats and proteins, Yes, then you will have various problems. This will lead to, you know, chronic degenerative diseases down the line if one keeps following this dietary pattern because of the Randall cycle. And of course, you know, there's other mechanisms involved, but the Randall cycle would be the uh, the primary one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think about the Randall cycle as well. You said when you mix macronutrients, how far apart do these macronutrients need to be consumed? Like if you consume a lot of fruit in the morning and then at night you have a huge meal of meat, does that instigate the Randall cycle? Um, that's actually a hard question to answer because of course there's going to be some, you know, genetic variability in this case. So uh, one person may digest it slower than another might. And therefore one might actually instigate the Randall cycle by consuming something, uh, say carbs at one hour of the day and then someone eats fats at another hour of the day as opposed to someone else say who's more physically active and um, their gastrointestinal tract works better than another again yeah. again this is all genetically very uh, yeah genetically variable of course so yeah that, that's quite a hard question to answer actually mm. that's it's very um yeah that's quite difficult to pinpoint okay mm. and um obviously you're a very Bright lad, chaos. So, so what does no. the the future look for, like for you? You said you finished your degree recently. What's the future mm -hmm. look like for you? Um, well, it's a hard one to be honest. 
Yeah. It would be nice to potentially produce more scientific literature, but I think for now, it's going to be something more uh, business oriented. Okay. Any more details, or is it just going to leave it like that? <laughs> well, I don't really have any details for now. Um, but hopefully, something that involves maybe starting my own business of some kind. I yeah. prefer to, you know, work for myself rather than for someone else, right? <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. Do you think nutrition and sort of physiology and um, neuroscience and stuff could play a role in that sort of business that you were thinking of? Or it's very possible. Yes, um, it's very possible. But I mean, other ideas could come to fruition. So I, I don't know. That's that's a yeah, hard yeah. question to answer for now. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it was it was great to have you on, Kale. Um, it was sick. Um, I'm sure our viewers will love this. We uh, we all learned a lot. Um, so where so Thank where can so we much. find you? <laughs> yes. So where can we find you, or you know, say someone wants to get in contact with you, or sure. Um, uh, what would you like? My Instagram handle, my Facebook. Sure. Yeah. All your social media and your yeah, I reckon. Okay, so my my uh my Instagram username is just uh my name underscore my last name. Yeah. Um yeah, my name is my name on Facebook. And uh I mean if you want my email, it's my name at my last name dot com dot au. It's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaya. You've been an incredible guest to have on and your knowledge. Oh, pleasure. Incredible. So yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you so much for hosting this as well. It's been a pleasure, guys. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a great chat. Thank you.